Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ray and welcome back to our beginner OpenGL ES and GL kit video tutorial series. In this part of the series, we're building up a simple 3D game with all the information we've learned so far. And now we're on the second part and this is one of the coolest parts because we're finally going to start building together our 3D game scene. Here's what the app will look like when you finish this part of the series. Remember, there are four steps to making this simple game. We already finished the refactoring to allow our game to use a nice scene graph. Now we're actually going to implement a real game scene that contains all of the models in our game. The paddle, the ball, and the array of bricks. In the next two videos, we're going to then add gameplay and finishing touches to the game. The first thing we have to do when setting up our game is figuring out the units of the game. The units can really be whatever is easiest for you to work with. Uh, what I did is I know the iPhone aspect ratio of the iPhone 5 is a 9 by 16 aspect ratio. So I said, well, I could use 9 by 16 as the units of where to place all of my items in the game, but I would prefer to, to have more units that would just make my life easier. So I said, well, I'll multiply it by 3. So I want what shows up on the screen to be 27 by 48. And now I just have to figure out how do I position the camera or in other words, how do I position the scene in a way such that I'm looking at an area of 27 by 48. So your next challenge is to figure out where do you place that camera so that it shows that 48 by 27 area that you're looking for. So this just involves a little bit of trigonometry. So if you sketch it out on paper here, what you're looking for is how far back do you place the camera. In other words, the scene offset here. But you do know a lot of information. You do know your desired game area height. That's 48. And so if you divide it by two, you get the one, one part of this triangle. You also know the field of view you want, because we've picked 85 degrees as our field of view. And if we divide that field of view by two, then we have the angle shown here. Well, guess what? Now we have an angle and one side of the triangle, and using some trigonometry, we can figure out the other side of the triangle. So remember back from trig that the tan of an angle is the opposite over the adjacent. So we have the opposite, which is game area height over two, we don't have adjacent yet, which is scene offset, but we do have the angle, so we can calculate the tan of angle. So next line, tan, tan of field of view divided by 2 equals, we just substitute in game area height divided by 2, and we substitute in scene offset. And then we can just do some multiplication to get the scene offset equals game area height divided by 2 divided by tangent of the field of view divided by 2. We can just plug in the numbers that we want here, and we'll get out a result. It turns out the result is 68.66 in this case. So the only last gotcha that we got to keep in mind is we need to set up when we're setting up our projection matrix, we need to make sure that that result there, that 68.66, which is how far back everything's going to be in our game, we want to make sure that that is bet between the near and the far planes. Because if it's in front of the near plane or further away from the far plane, it won't be visible. But we're going to set up our near plane to be 1 and our far plane to be 150, so that's no problem. It'll just show up in there perfectly. The other thing we need to do when setting up our camera or scene, depending on the way you think about it, is by default it's going to be looking down at 0, 0. But we want 0, 0 to be the center of our view here. So we need to move the entire scene by the game area's width divided by 2 and the game area's height divided by 2. And the last thing, just for fun, we're going to rotate the entire scene a little bit so we're looking down on it. Even though we'll be playing the game in a 2D plane, we're going to be looking at it from a 3D perspective just to make the game look a little bit cooler. All right, we have the game where we left it off in the last tutorial. We have this rotating mushroom as before, but this time we're nicely set up to use a nice scene graph. Well, before we move on to working on our game scene, there's a slight change I want to make to our shaders here. So in our game, we're going to have models for the bricks. And we're going to want to have a bunch of different colored bricks. And I don't want to have to make a bunch of different models to represent the different bricks. I want to use the same model, just color each one differently. I want to have, instead of colors per, on a per vertex basis, I want to have just a color that applies to the whole model. So we're going to make a tweak to our shader to let us specify a color for the entire model. So the way we're going to do this is going to our fragment shader. I'm just going to add a new uniform for the material color here. And then down here in the frag color, Notice how we're not even multiplying it by the vertex color anymore, because instead we'll use this global matte color right here. So moving on to the base effect.h, we'll add a new property for that. 
to the dot m we'll make a new uniform variable for that and here where we load the uniforms we'll load up the matte color uniform and scrolling down to the bottom where we set the uniforms we will set the uniform based on our variable there Similarly, we will modify our node class to have also a matte color. And to test this out, oh, actually in the dot M, before we call prepare to draw, we have to pass that matte color onto the shader. Finally, just to test this out, I'm gonna set the color here to red, say. So I run this and you see I've tinted this entire mushroom red now. This will come in handy when we're working with the game models. That's it for the shader modifications. Now let's move on to creating our game scene. So I'm going to, actually while I'm doing this, um, I'm gonna go to our directory structure here and I'll create a new folder for scenes, just to keep the scenes a little bit easier to find than the normal nodes. So we'll move the test scene, whoops, into scenes and we'll, uh, okay, we'll delete these two from the project because they're no longer there and add the new scene folder in there. Okay, so just a little bit or better organized. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a new scene called RWT Game Scene. And it's gonna derive from RWT Node here. And as always, it will have the standard initializer. And then let's switch to the .m to implement that. Okay, the first thing we need to do is create the initial scene position. And also think of that as the setting the position of the camera. So to, to run these calculations, we need to keep track of the game area we want. So let's create an instance variable for that. And remember from the slide, I've just decided to make the game area 27 by 48 because I thought that made it easy for me to figure out the placement for all of the items I wanted in the game, but it didn't really matter what I chose here as long as it was the same aspect ratio of the device. Okay, so now we need to calculate the scene offset, which is how far back the camera should be. So let's make a float for that. And we're gonna use the same algorithm from the slides here. It's basically the game area height divided by two, divided by the tangent of the perspective field of view that we've selected, which is 85. Let me double check that that's correct. Um, so yeah, we've chosen 85 as our field of view there. So the field of view divided by two, the tangent of that. And that gives us the scene offset. So then when we're setting the position of the scene, we want to have minus game area width divided by two and minus game area height divided by two. That basically sets it so zero, zero is in the lower left corner of the scene. And then we do minus game scene offset. Okay, now we have our camera set up the way we want. And now let's test this out by adding a model to this scene. So I actually have already, in the demo resources for this demo, I have a bunch of models already created. Vicky actually created some models for me in Blender. And then I ran OBJ loader on them to get the H and .m for each one. And I also created some nodes using the same technique that we have already done in this workshop. So rather than waste time doing that again, you know the drill by now. So I'm just gonna go ahead and drag those in. So let's drag these models into the model folder. Let's drag the nodes in to the nodes folder. And we're not gonna use sounds in this part, but just so we have them all ready when we're ready for them, let's take the sounds folder and drag that in as well. One of the items inside the models I just drug in was the paddle. So we have a paddle.h, a paddle.m. We also have a node called RWT paddle that loads in the vertices from this file. Another thing that we've done here is we're going to need a width and height for calculation purposes for each of these models. So let's go ahead and add a property for that onto our DBT node. Okay, everything builds okay. Now, going back to our game scene, let's go ahead and add a paddle near the bottom of the screen. We need a variable for the paddle.
Now for positioning it, remember the position of a node is relative to its parent's position, okay? So we want it to be centered within our parent node. So we know that our node is of size game area. So the center of that would be game area of width divided by two, and the height is game area dot height times some fraction, and we'll put 0 0.05, so we want it near the bottom. And for Z, we'll just have everything. We're gonna have everything on zero inside here. And we're gonna color it with the matte color thing we added, and we're gonna make it red. And finally, to get it to display, all we have to do is say self.children, add object, paddle. Now let's go ahead and test this. We're gonna go back to our view controller and switch it from using the RWT test scene to using the RWT game scene. So if I build and run, check it out. We now have a paddle, which really is just a, some kind of rectangle made in Blender at the bottom of the screen. So now we can repeat the same technique to start adding more objects. So next let's go ahead and add the ball in. We're using 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.05 to make it slightly higher up. Make it a greenish sort of color. And we'll add it as a child just like we did for the paddle. Now if I run, check it out, we got a ball right above the paddle. Um, Vicky has also made me an object that represents a border around the edge of the screen, so let's add that in. She's made this border so it has the same dimensions as the dimensions of the screen, you know, the 27 by 48, if you position it in the center of the screen. So I'll just center this and add it as a child. If you're a Cocos 2D or SpriteKit developer, you'll notice that this code looks very similar to the way Cocos 2D or SpriteKit works, and this is by no accident. This is actually how the exact same way those game frameworks work, and this is why it's kind of cool learning OpenGL because you in developing your own game engine, you get a better appreciation for what those other game engines are doing for you. I'm going to run this. Notice how I can't see the um, border here. That's because I actually forgot to set a default color for when I don't set the matte color. So going back to, let's see here, RWT node, I want to make sure that in the initializer we set up a default color. Okay, so set up a default color right now. The border, you can see it here, shows up okay. So there's this black, darker line around the edges. Okay, next up, we're gonna start adding the bricks. And the bricks are interesting because we want to have different colors based on where the brick is. So kind of a rainbow look and feel. So we're gonna have a grid of bricks. And so the first thing we're gonna do is make two constants for how many rows and columns we wanna generate. Okay, the first thing we need to do is generate some of these rainbow colors for the brick. So I'm gonna bring in a helper function that I got off Stack Overflow to automatically get some color values. And I'm just gonna literally paste this in. If you're looking for this method, you can copy it out of the demo finished that will come with this project here. But all this does is you give it a X value between zero and one, I believe and it gives you a, a corresponding rainbow color. So let's start filling in the colors we're actually gonna use. So we'll make an array of vector four here. And then we'll make a loop to get a color for each of these. So basically, the first one, like if i was zero, bricks per row minus i would be zero, so it'd be zero out of however many bricks per row is, the next would be one out of however many bricks per row is, so it's basically a range from zero to one, and we get a different rainbow color going through. So now that we have this, we want to generate an array of all the bricks, and we're gonna make a, an immutable array for that. Okay, so we have a loop looping through columns and rows. So for each of these, we'll create a brick. And I need to import the header file up here for that. Now 
Now we need to figure out where to position the brick. So we're going to have a margin value here, which basically says the spacing we want between bricks. We also want a start Y position. So we don't want them starting before half of the height goes by. And then we can simply set the position of the brick by this. So we set the position being the left margin plus some additional left margins based on how many rows it is and then the Y by how many margins times the number of columns it is. And then we set the color by looking it up by the colors here. And then we add this brick as a child. We also add it to our bricks array. And uh, let's see how that looks with bricks now. So check it out. We now have some bricks in the scene. And they're rotating because it happens that the brick class that I brought in, it has an update with delta method that just makes them rotate for fun. And uh, you can see the nice specular shading going on too. So uh, there's one last thing I want to do here. And just for fun, we're going to make this entire screen tilted. So it's a little more obvious that we're in 3D and not 2D here. So going back to the game scene, here where we're setting the scene offset and position, I'm also going to set a rotation. So if I run that, now everything's rotated. But to me, it doesn't look quite right um, having all this empty space up here. So in addition, I'm going to move everything else up by 10. So I think that looks a little bit better. So as you can see, even though I've positioned the scene in a different way, everything inside this scene as children are still positioned relatively in the right spots because the positions of the children are with respect to the positions of the scene. So I can move the scene however I want. In other words, move the camera however I want, but these guys will still be in the same position. And that's the beauty of a scene graph for you. All right, that's it for this video tutorial. And as always, we'd like to leave you off with a challenge. As I said last time, this is a special case. It's your final challenge and it's combined with the next two videos. So just keep on watching. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.